If you want to check out snippets from my own cartoony sci-fi comic series, Smacked in the Head the Animated Series, hopefully crowdfunding soon, there's a link in the description below. Crap, I am definitely not complaining. But seriously, why are there so many Bernie Wrightson stories in this issue of Creepy? Oh, well there we are then. Happy Halloween, kitties! It's great to see you again. I asked on Twitter, and I think a live stream, a while back for any horror comic suggestions, and I got a grand total of zero. So after many tribulations, I was forced to return to that fount of 60 sequential horror. Creepy Magazine from Warren Publishing. I decided to just pull two random short stories from any of the 145 issues when by chance I happened to come across this issue. I think this may be one of the most well known from the series. How can you not love that cover? That that leg is a bit ridiculous, but I love this. I especially love the blood-filled swamp, and of course the T-Rex! Spoiler, not that many of these reviews aren't filled with spoilers. There actually is no T-Rex in any of the stories beyond this image. There's a lake monster, but no T-Rex. Sorry. So if you're going to do a special issue, you can't go wrong with Bernie Wrightson. And it feels extra appropriate since I recently got my hardcover Frankenstein book out of storage. Buy this book. The man's art is unbelievable. I defy you to find me one person that doesn't love him as an artist. I've shown you Bernie before, co-creator of Swamp Thing. You get it. You've seen his art, I have no doubt. So Creepy Magazine 113, special Bernie Wrightson issue. When they do something like this, it makes me think that they paid him to do a bunch of stories earlier on and then just sat on them until they needed to fill an issue. Yeah, we're out of ideas. Pull the Bernie file. Let's just make a special. I'm cool with it. Just wondering about the thought process. Ooh. Warren Publishing Company proudly presents Genuine Soil from Dracula's Castle Authentic Soil from Vlad's Castle in Transylvania Wow! Actual Earth! How much is one gram? Not gonna lie, I want this. No judgments, kids, in 1979. I bought something far less fancy on the way to Las Vegas before. Mmm, top secret dirt. Yes. I feel like I brought this pendant up in a previous video. Probably the last creepy Vampirilla Halloween episode. Link in the description below. Reading the description, they say, Encased in clear plastic, artistically secured in a golden chain, this dust of Dracula can now be preserved through lifetimes to come. I'm totally picturing that as like a cheesy Stephen King story where it accidentally gets cracked open, or the kid that bought it accidentally cuts his finger trying to get it open and a drop of blood falls into the dust, which really actually is Dracula's ashes, thus reviving him. Man, you would think you were buying Bela Lugosi's Dracula ring for that price. So here we go, creepy number 113. Presents, uh, oh, we already said all that, didn't we? Seven classic tales of terror. I feel like I've seen this shot of Uncle Creeper's sale as a print or something before. Yeah, there you go. God, that's good. So we're just going to focus on two stories out of the seven contained in here. Here's our list of comic slaves. So let's start with the first story appearing in this issue. Its starting point is clearly the classic scene in Frankenstein, with the key difference being that the monster is actually muck. Well, not yet. I am. Only of that am I completely certain. Here's a shot of a cemetery as our narrator talks about his experience coming into the world, starting with darkness. He sees Dr. Frankenstein's identical twin standing over him working and muttering. He's unable to move but can experience everything going on around him, seen through what he calls rude, ever-staring eyes. God bless! Look at the lines! Bernie was a serious beast, man. Anywho, Thomas Frankenstein, they never actually name him, loses his sh over being completely unsuccessful in raising the monster to life. I knew not what I was. I only knew that I should not be. Our monster says he wanted to explain, but couldn't. He was an aware being, just couldn't move his body. The doctor's rage reaches its peak heights when he whips out a knife and chops the creature up, enraging the monster himself. 
carrying the pieces of the failed experiment, the doctor drops them into a tank of acid. The monster continues talking about how he just wants to make the doctor aware of his folly, and how he doesn't understand. The creature's parts bubble and smoke as he slowly dissolved into a black slug, which a doctor ends up dumping out through a sewer grate. Pretty sure that would be illegal. Now a transformed sentient slime monster flows out of the castle and down a hill. I flowed onward through the woods and over a retaining wall ever downward to a place of the dead. Oh, that looks like the grave from the prologue. I suppose we were just catching an early glimpse of it at this point. The muck man seeps down into the soil. Man, that guy wasn't even buried in a coffin. Did they spend all the money on the tombstone? So he bonds somehow with the corpse in the ground. Emerging, effusing. And the reconstituted creature pulls himself free. Apparently the doctor was missing the step where you puree the creature, then attach it to another dead body to get the results he wanted. Back at the castle. Love this shot. All underlit and sh the doctor screams as the monster comes shambling through the doorway, and he continues to monologue about wanting to comfort the doctor's fear and show him it was a mistake in creating him. The good doctor survival mode immediately kicks in and he starts laughing like a madman, leading to our monster to realize that it's no use and he shambles away. So the monster takes to a mountaintop to wax philosophical. Does that which is go on forever? Yet perhaps it just passes on. Perhaps it just ceases to exist. He says the sun rises and the day is born, and he says he's a part of that celebration, and that this mountaintop is where he belongs. For I too have found a home, a purpose, forever. Very poetic, somewhat unclear. The whole story the monster's been saying, I exist but I shouldn't, and then by the end of the story he says that he's found a purpose. I'm not sure what that purpose is. Is it the idea of just existing? Is there a hidden profundity? profundity in here? Let me know what you think in the comments. Amazing drawings, very Frankenstein. Not necessarily true horror. No one dies, the monster doesn't eat anyone. Not scary, just a lot of cool dramatic moody art. The comic books is interesting. I suppose you could consider it an op-ed talking about comic relevant stories of the day. This particular one talks about Disney suing some comic artists back in the day for a quote-unquote parody book called Mickey Mouse Meets the Air Pirates Funnies, a very adult book. The argument made is based on the fact that the characters are behaving in ways that they wouldn't normally in family content, and that's what constitutes it as a parody. Clearly it's Mickey Mouse though. They even say his name on the cover and call him it in the story. I hate Disney, but the dude clearly did nothing to distinguish his parody from the Disney characters. Like, make Mickey a rat with a long nose or something, put some kind of design on his pants, change it somehow. Just because Mickey and Minnie are messing around, I fail to see how that warrants parody. Like, has the attitude of what constitutes parody really changed since the late 70s? Like, am I just a product of a world that's already changed and you could say that people just thought differently back then? In the end, he goes on to make a point about how one-sided the justice system is and how corporations with deep pockets always come out on top. And on some levels, most levels, he's not wrong. This rules for thee, not for me attitude clearly exists in the world today, especially coming from Disney for the last few decades. Anywho, The Laughing Man is good. About two circus carnies that go to the Ugani Valley to bag an intelligent man -aid. Gorilla Grodd is gonna be pissed. The Pepper Lake monster story is amusing in its own right, and if you ever wanted to study how to draw waves, there's a plenty. I'll tell you, I'm seriously missing Uncle Creepy introducing these stories, though. What the heck, man? He was around a few issues ago, but now he's just gone. I asked my buddy about it who's super into these things, and he suggested maybe it was artists missing deadlines and they just had stories on hand. But on to our next one. You know, normally I would walk you through this kind of a story and add commentary as we went, describing the scenes, you know, try and make it more transformative, but I I think this story stuck out the most to me, so uh, if you'll forgive me, I'm just, I'm gonna try and uh, read this for you in an entertaining fashion. But I thought it was worth actually sharing the whole story with you. Flat out a poem, just dealing with a dude's grief over his dead wife. It reads very much like something from Edgar Allan Poe. Gone! 
Ah, God, four letters only. One word, one thought, one breath of air. Get all of life to one who hungers, one who clings to night's despair. Gone she is this black December, as December's past compare. And my soul gone out there with her, through all snows of yesteryear. Still she stands aglow before me, pale and tender, warm and rare. Still she runs through meadows laughing, locked in memory, slumber's snare. We share then the raindrop's laughter, we join then in springtime's flare. We embrace the summer's glory, we steal kisses on autumn dares. Till the evenings come too quickly, and the stars hang cold and stare. And she trembles like a flower, under snow the winter shares. And those snows take once more from me, my whole life, my single air. To face this cabin's chill awakening, begging God in drunken prayer. Why I come here every season, driven by the ghost of dread, I cannot in truth you answer, lest tis guilt I'm blindly led. To these oaken walls I stumble, nightmares clutched in vain and shed, while within the fireplace dances flames of things we did and said. I recall now, edged forever, on my mind by reverie fed, together here near these same andirons, toasting Yuletide's nodding head. Me, the fool of wine's gay prison, she still light in firelight's red. Sought the bitter night for firewood, for we sank to Christmas bed. I ne'er heard the door behind her blow tight shut in frame of lead, or her rapping, her pounding. I was to the world one dead. How she suffered agonizing, how her scraping fingernails bled, how she screamed my name in terror. I'll relive in years ahead. Will my brain some day diminish sight? Reluctant eyes must show, beckoning still on frozen doorstep, screaming silent with the crow. There my wits from me departed, madness came with icy blow, as she reached with clutching talons for a warmth she'd never know. On a field of desolation, neath ice-covered limbs that bow, there I lay her silent figure, while the sun sank ever low. And all night I heard her screaming, all the next day pounding flow of her fists against the oak wood, phantom claws that won't let go. Oh, I'd give my life so gladly, all years left me just to see one short glimpse of my beloved to have now what used to be. To hold in arms decayed with wanting that fragile form once part of me. And feel those ember eyes that beckon to sanity's door, they hold the key. If I could believe she hears me, knows my anguish, feels my pain, I'd leave this mortal husk forever and let her wandering spirit claim. To see her stand once more before me, to know her touch while I yet live, to hear her tender voice console me. Beloved husband, I forgive. Sorry, I just thought it was a really nice poem and in a lot of effort put into just like a silly late 70s horror comic. Moving right along, there's also the first of what I understand as a series of classic horror adaptations by Wrightson. This one being adapted from H.P. Lovecraft's Cool Air story. Again, fantastic art. Wait, what the f***? Is that Cousin Eerie hosting? Where the hell is Creepy? Country Pie is a kidnapper story with a twist and a psychic. Not bad. Lately I've realized just how much I really love sci-fi horror. So uh, I would have done this story, but all the panels are vertical, and it just would have been a pain to get through. And that's it! Ads! Moonraker! Star Wars! I love seeing the old Star Wars toy ads. Gifts! Everybody wants to give you a gift. Ah yeah, these books. I actually looked some of them up, like Dracula's Gold! They're kind of amazing looking, actually. What do you think of this layout, putting all of the ads in the back of the book? Do you think that's better? Probably not for the advertisers. Necronomicon with weird lettering by H.R. Geiger, Moonraker, and done. So usually I say what I can take away from my own projects that I've learned while reading these old back issues. As far as art, Bernie was a master and you can look at any given panel and find something to apply. But really the biggest thing for me was recognizing a different angle in the genre I never really considered before. I, and I'm sure many, many others, have often said that the best horror stories have a healthy amount of humor in them. If you can make me laugh while also scaring me, that's the best. 
But there's also something really great about horror that's beautiful. I think I've heard people mention the concept before, but I never really gave it much thought. That Clarice story was beautiful, though. When I first started reading it, the visuals of that shambling skeleton was creepy as heck, and a hair-raising moment, and I was immediately on board. But by the end, the switch is made, and he's just on his knees begging for one more chance. It's heartbreaking. Even the premise of Muckman asking basic philosophical questions of existence, being stitched together together with limbs ripped from the bodies of other corpses only to be melted down and reassembled chemically again, and all the while aware of everything that's happening. I think it's that contrast of absolute horrific with something pure. I dig it. I have an idea for a spin-off horror series from the main Smacked in the Head universe, and it's kind of cool just to know that there are other angles that you can take to horror, rather than just the standard ways that typically spring to mind. I'm sure none of these concepts are original. But that's it, kitties. It's almost time for Garfield's Halloween adventure in the Great Pumpkin, Charlie Brown. My standard way of closing out the Halloween season, which seriously is always way too short. But if you're looking for more spooky fun, spooky fun? Check out my previous Vampirella creepy episode, along with the quick sketch of both characters. Then check out the two Pumpkin Brothers specials I've done in the past couple of years featuring sexy witches. Also, I just opened the Nazi shop if you need some cool original character vinyl stickers. Link below! And that's it. Have a safe and happy Halloween. Or a dangerous and delirious one. I don't care. I'm not your parents. Good, good. Mm. Mm.